The Mishnah says, any love that is dependent on a third thing, on a, on a thing, when the thing goes away, the love will go away too. A love that is not based on a thing, that love will never go away, will never end. Actually, there are two versions in the Mishnah. One version says, any love that is dependent on a thing that can go away, then when that thing goes away, the love will go away. Which means to imply, if your love is dependent on a thing that will not go away, then your love won't go away. The al when he when he writes the Mishnah in his Siddur, doesn't say that, doesn't bring that version. He says simply, a love that is dependent on a thing, not a thing that could go away. So, ava hatluya bedavar batel, that's the other version. The al version is, ava hatluya bedavar batel davar batel. Here the obvious question is, where's the great wisdom? It's really rather obvious. If your love is dependent on something, well, then, it, then it's dependent. What does dependent mean? It means that if the thing goes away, the love goes away. So where's the wisdom here? If you love me for my money, and I lose my money, you're not going to love me anymore. This is brilliant. Profound wisdom. To make matters worse, the Mishnah then gives us an example, in case you don't understand. In case this is too profound and deep, the Mishnah says, what is an example for a love that was dependent on a thing? The love of Amnon and Tamar. And what is an example of a love that is not dependent on a thing? The love of David and Yonasan. Yet we really need an example? And by the way, what, what does the example help? What, what, is the, what does the example tell us? Amnon and Tamar loved each other and then they stopped loving each other? David and Yonason never stopped loving each other. So, I mean, what does that tell us? How does that prove the point? How do you know why Amnon and Tamar stopped loving each other? How do you know why David and Yonason didn't stop loving each other? So you can't just bring proof that a love that is dependent will end if the, by showing me somebody who, who stopped loving. <laughs> why did he stop loving? How do you know why? He, so the Rebbe offer us a few insights. Number one, the Mishnah says a love that is dependent on something, not a love that comes from something. Now we would, we would think that if the love you have is caused by some other consideration, then when that consideration goes away, the love will go away. For example, if I love you for your money, then if you don't have money, I'm not going to love you anymore. That's not what the Mishnah is saying. That's a love that comes from money. The Mishnah is talking about a love that is dependent on money. It's a different concept. The fact is that if I love you for your money, and the money goes away, I might just surprise you. Because even after the money goes away, I continue to love you. Because I began to love you for your money, but I'm not dependent on that. So it happens very often that we fall in love for one reason. We stay married for a completely different reason. That's pretty common. The reason you think you're marrying your husband or wife turns out not to be real. It's not even there then why do you stay married? Oh, well, for a lot of other reasons. So what caused you to love doesn't necessarily mean that your love is dependent. Now, the same is true in reverse. It could be that you started off loving unconditionally. Does that guarantee you'll always love? No. Your love can become dependent on something. So the original understanding of the Mishnah is that we're talking about what caused the love. 
The Rebbe says, no, the mission is talking about what's happening now, not what was. Right now, is your love dependent on something? Then it's, then it's in danger. If right now it's not dependent on anything, then it's not in danger. How did the love get to be? That's not important. Because it can switch. So, the Mishnah is not saying, don't love somebody for the wrong reason. That's not beyond the letter of the law. We're going deeper than that. It doesn't matter how you fell in love. The question is, what are you doing now? So that even if you fell in love for the wrong reason, fix it. Because what's happening now is important, not how it began. So when people come and say, oh, my marriage is all a mess because it's not what I thought it would be. Okay, that was then. What's now? Now make it work. It's not what you thought it would be. Maybe it's better than you thought. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have thought that in the first place. But now you're married, make it work. That's why he gives the example of these two instances. The story of Amnon and Tamar is a tragic story. They were the children of David, David's children, and they were brother and sister. But Amnon, the brother, fell in love with Tamar incestuously. And once they committed incest, he hated her more than he ever loved her. And it was a tragedy. Eventually, Amnon's brother killed him, and it was a very nasty story. So what happened there? Why did Amnon love Tamar? Originally, because she was his sister. No reason, no condition. It was a love without a condition. But as she got older, he started to be attracted to her beauty, which is a condition. So he went from an unconditional love, and it turned into a conditional love. So he started off with a love that was not dependent on anything, and it became dependent. And once they had sinned, and the attraction was finished, now he hated her. Because the, the dependent ingredient was gone, so the love is gone. story with David and, uh, and Jonasson is the exact opposite. It started off as a love dependent on a thing. They were, they were uh, Yonason was helping him, saving him, telling him secrets from the, from the palace. So it was a practical friendship, but it became unconditional. Why? Because he event, they eventually loved each other for their virtue, for their godliness, and their godliness was forever. Now we can apply this, of course, to our love of God as well. And that's one more thing about Perkyavos. Sometimes when we read the Mishnah, it sounds very much like a statement about human relations. A friend, a neighbor, and it turns out that it's referring to God. That friend in this context means God. In this Mishnah, a love that is dependent or not dependent, it sounds like human relations. It also applies to God. The Gemara says, a person should study Torah for the wrong reasons. Because from the wrong reason, he will eventually come to study for the right reason. So if a person says, I'm not sure I should do a mitzvah because I've got an ulterior motive for doing the mitzvah. It's okay. Do it for the ulterior motive. Why? Because a love that begins on a condition can switch. On the other hand, the person who says, I have no conditions. I am naturally religious. <laughs> I, I was born religious. Don't get comfortable because it can switch. So stay on your toes and, and keep the goal in mind and don't relax and think you're there because it came spontaneously or it came naturally. So the statement, do the mitzvah or study the Torah even with an ulterior motive, because from the ulterior motive you can get to the no motive or proper motive, is taken from this Mishnah. What do we have in practical application? When you change the tense of the Mishnah 
from past to present, which is essentially what the Rebbe did. Instead of talking about what caused the love, what started the love, the Mishnah is really talking about what is the love doing now. If we could do this in our relationships, we would be very wise, beyond the letter of the law. If we are dependent on the origins, if we're dependent on how it began, that's limiting, that's being restricted to the law, the law of nature. If it started off on the wrong foot, well, naturally, it's not going to work. So if you live by the letter of the law, there isn't much hope. Most people will say, you know, if it, if it starts off wrong and you got off on the wrong foot, cancel it, start all over again. Don't try to fix a bad thing. Because even if you fix it, you patch it up, it'll never be good. That's if you live by the law. If you live by beyond the letter of the law, then new possibilities open up. What would otherwise not be possible becomes possible and desirable and virtuous. So by turning it into the present tense, a love that is not dependent on anything will never go away. Is not saying you are either a victim of a bad relationship or you lucked out with a good relationship you can make it what it needs to be at any point in the relationship. So you may have been very unfortunate and your relationship started out very bad because you have no muzzle, but you are capable of turning that relationship into something that will never end. Because if you're not dependent on it, then it's indestructible. Now let's look at it in a bigger picture. Take the Mishnah out of, out of its limited context into some cosmic significance. The laws of nature restrict us in many ways. And therefore, we're always thinking about what's possible, what's not possible. What could be, what can't be. If we live within the letter of the law, then we become the victims of those laws. If we have a country of our own, then we'll be secure. If we have to be scattered to the four corners of the heavens and live in other people's countries, we'll never survive. That's the law. If you're intimidated, which means you're dependent on that law, then you can't last very long. The law does not permit you to exist. The law says you can't. By the same token in medicine, if the law, the law of nature, the law of health and medicine says no one can survive this condition, well, then you can't survive this condition. So if your love or your enthusiasm or your life, your pleasure, is dependent on the law, then you can only be as real as the law. But if your love is not dependent, then all sorts of possibilities open up. So in this case, what does beyond the letter of the law mean? There are times when beyond the letter of the law in Pirkei Ovos means beyond human habit. Most human beings would be arrogant. You got to go humble. Most human beings are selfish. You got to... So you're going against the, the nature of the human being. Sometimes beyond the letter of the law means beyond the laws of nature. Sometimes it means beyond the laws of Torah. So, for example, according to Torah law, there are only three sins that you're not allowed to violate, even if it costs you your life. Every other sin you should violate and save your life. What would be beyond the letter of the law? We see it all the time in Jewish history where people could have saved their lives by eating non-kosher food, and they refused. They couldn't eat it. Torah law says, go ahead and eat it. Some people are beyond the letter of the law. They can't eat it. You say, so they're sinning. No, they're not. They can't. It's like telling them to eat chalk. They can't. It sticks in their throat. 
Why? Because they exist beyond the letter of the law. I had this uh, incident, I think I mentioned it uh, on other occasions. This, uh, the mother asked me to talk to her daughter, who had a Jewish girl, who had become a born-again convert. And I really didn't want to do it because there's just no talking to them. It's, it's, you know, it's a closed door. They saw something and that's it. You know. So there's no point in trying to reason. So I really didn't want to do it. But the mother was desperate. So. so I made up my mind that I would be patient. Because there's no, there's no point in getting upset. So when she came in and she told me what happened and how her, her experience... So after she finished, I said, can I ask you a personal question? Do you keep kosher? So she says, you don't understand. There was a time when I needed to keep kosher in order to get to heaven. But since grace was given, I don't have to keep kosher to get to heaven. I said, I, I, I do understand, I understand. But I'm just curious, do you keep kosher? So she explained it again. So I said to her, I understand. I'm just asking you personally, do you keep kosher? So she explained it again, how she doesn't have to keep kosher because she can get to heaven without it. So I said, just tell me yes or no. Do you keep kosher? She says, why are you asking me that? I said, because you sound like somebody who really loves God. So I'm just wondering whether you're keeping kosher even though you can get to heaven without it, I'm just wondering whether you're keeping kosher just for him. Because he says that it's, it bothers him. So I'm just wondering, do you keep kosher without needing to? Just for him. She got very flustered. And she excused herself. This was in the old, in the old Lubavitch house. She ran to the phone Came back about 15 minutes later. The smile was back, glassy-eyed. She's okay. What happened? She called her uh, mentor, her teacher, and the teacher told her that she's not allowed to keep kosher because if she keeps kosher, it might suggest that she doesn't trust the grace to get her to heaven. So she should not keep kosher. So now she's all happy. Anyway, it went downhill from there. She left. And I thought, I knew I shouldn't have done this. There's no point to this. Anyway, a few hours later, I called the mother to say, you know, what's, what, what's going on? Because I was sure she would come back and say, the rabbi is insulting, he's, he's, he's nasty, he's... Not a word. The girl came back and was muttering to herself. Kept asking me if I keep kosher. <laughs> that stuck in her mind. The names I called her and what I accused her of didn't make any impression at all. But even after she was told that she doesn't have to keep kosher, it, that's called beyond the letter of the law. You know you're, you're, you're going to get to heaven anyway. But can you really eat food that you know God doesn't like? When you go beyond the letter of the law, where do you end up? It's a very important question to ask before you go. <laughs> so if you're going to go beyond the letter of the law, where are you going to end up? You see, and that's why the people who were uh, a little hesitant about Hasidim <laughs> in the early years, it's because Hasidim said, we got to do beyond the letter of the law. And they said, but where does that take you? Where do you end up if you go beyond the letter of the law? This is dangerous. What does beyond the letter of the law mean? And this little story is a good illustration. Beyond the letter of the law means I am reacting and responding not to the law, but to the one who gave it. So what is beyond the letter of the law? The lawgiver. What else is there? So if you go past the law, you get to the giver of the law. So you get to God himself. So in this case, the law tells you how you get to heaven, how you don't get to heaven. But if you go beyond the letter of the law, it doesn't matter how you get to heaven. God doesn't like that food. He says so. Don't eat those kakami... I don't know what the exact language... I'm paraphrasing. 
God says, don't eat those foods because they are an abomination in my eyes. One more thought on this Mishnah. A love that is dependent on a thing, when the thing goes away, the love goes away. What is the most common thing that love is dependent on? The thing that love is most dependent on is me. What does my love depend on? Me, my mood, my opinion. If I have a love and the love is dependent on my opinion, I change my opinion about you, that's it, the love is gone. Or if I'm not in the mood, then there is no love. Because the love depends on me. I'm the one who's doing the loving. So the question now is, if that's the thing that most love is dependent on, then it's not even possible to have a love that is not dependent. What is it, a love without a person? Disembodied love? Love means what I feel towards you. How can that not be dependent on me? How can I love you independent of me? So, how can you have a love that is not dependent on a thing? You're the thing. That's the biggest dependence of all. And that's why you say, a person says, I love you. I will love you forever. Why are you not so convinced? You can't say that. You can't promise me that. Whatever love you're feeling is dependent on you. How can you promise me you'll always love? You can't say that. You don't know that. You could get into a bad mood. Who knows? You could outgrow me. I could outgrow you. And then the love is gone. So now, what does the Mishnah mean? A love that is not dependent on a thing. So... Let's take it a step higher. There is a love that I feel for you because that's what I love. I love your type. I love your humor. I love your energy. I love your, your looks. Why? That's my taste. Somebody else who looked like you and had the same humor, I'd love them too. Because <laughs> I love this type, right? I love these things. And why do I love these things? Because, because, I mean, that's me. You love what you love, I love what I love. And I happen to love you. That's a very dependent love. It depends on me. There's another kind of love. There's something about you that makes me love you. So it's not I am in love with you. You cause me to love you. So I'm not the thing anymore. So my love is not dependent on me anymore. Even when I'm in a bad mood, you put me into a good mood. Because you are the cause of the love, not me. For example, a person who says, I'm not really the loving type, but, but you do something to me. You make me feel love. Or I'm in a really bad mood, but when you come into the room, my mood changes. So it's not dependent on me. You light up my life. <laughs> of course, the problem with that is, now you're the thing. All right, but that's not my problem. You see, it's not like I'm warning you, your love is not going to last because you're the thing. No, no, I'm not the thing. As far as I'm concerned, my love will last forever. Now, if you mess up, well, okay, then you're destroying it, not me. But that's feeble, right? But then what's left? What's left? What's left is if we both love something that is bigger than both of us. So I'm not the thing, and you're not the thing. There's something bigger than both of us that brings us together. So, then that's the thing? No, that's not a thing. Things, I and mean, we know what things are. That's not a thing. God is not a thing. 
So if we come together and we are pledged to each other because God wants us to be that way, that's not a thing. God is not an object. But here's the, uh, the punchline that only the Mishnah could tell us because modern wisdom would never. The nature of intimacy, which is such a mysterious subject for some reason, that we can't seem to figure it out because we're given all the wrong information about it. What is the nature of intimacy? The nature of intimacy is two people who have nothing interfering, separating one from the other. When nothing separates two people, that's intimacy. Because generally, if you have two people, you have two separate realities. You have two separate entities. Well, as long as they're separate entities, they're not intimate. Intimate means a blurring of the borders. Where I'm not me and you're not you, and, and you can't tell where one begins and the other ends. That's called intimacy. So, by definition, intimacy cannot be identified. You can't point to it and say, there it is. Because intimacy is not a thing. It's a non-thing. It's when no thing comes between us, then we're intimate. But if intimacy is treated as a thing, then it becomes the problem. So a love that is not dependent on anything. I mean, intimacy that is not a thing, that's never going to end. But if intimacy becomes a thing, it will end. So when our grandparents, or maybe our great-grandparents, when we asked them, what goes on between a husband and wife? And they said, nothing. You thought they were lying. You thought they were being evasive. They were telling you the truth. There is no thing that exists between husband and wife. And because there's no thing between them, that's why they're intimate, and that's how you can make a baby. And that can go on forever. That will never end.